2019. Speaking of the Berkeley County Health Department, co-hosting with the mogul Michael Hornby is uh, Mr. Bill Kearns, Executive Director of the Berkeley County Health Department until he quits in the near future. Quits. Because he's a quitter. Quits. That is. Yeah, you're sweating. Yeah. You're abandoning us. Yeah. And so far. (laughs) Retirement is just a nicer word for quitting, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. So says the envious person. They don't have that. Remember that, Rob. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have Bill here to help me with this today Uh because he's classified as a quitter as well. Uh, by the way, by you. Bill, after you retire from that, it just makes you more available to work for free here as a co-host. Just remember that. Oh, I've been told that as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the heat is on, as Glenn Fry once said. Uh-huh. Now, our guest in this segment is Senator Shelley Moore Capito via telephone. She will be at the Stubblefield Institute just a couple of days here. I think September 9 uh, is that day. Senator Capito, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, actually, the Stubblefield event is tonight. Oh, it's tonight? I thought it was September 9. Did I read my notes incorrectly? Uh, yeah, no, I, you, yes, you did. Yeah, my apologies. It, unless, I'm, unless I'm headed to the wrong event, <laughs> no. you read your notes incorrectly. You're, you're good. I just write poorly is what, it, is what that is there. So I trust you and Kelly more to know exactly where you are supposed to be, more so than I would trust me to know where you're supposed to be. Right. Yeah. Good. Uh, tell us about the, this event at the Stubblefield Institute tonight. Well, as you know, it was created uh, with Bill Stubblefield and his wife to uh, incentivize and to highlight uh, civility and and those of us working together across the aisle. And they invited us, uh, us being me and uh, Senator Manchin, to come and talk about not only the civility that we have between one another as uh, the two senators from the state, but also about what does it mean to be a West Virginian. And so I'm not really sure where it's going to go. I think it'll be a free flow dialogue. I have my ideas of how proud I am to be one and, and things that we can do better. So, uh, and Hoppy Kirchival is going to be the moderator. So it'll be a lively discussion, I think. And I, I believe it'll be well attended and talk with Mary Hendricks. She's excited to have us on the Shepherd campus. As more people, and this is kind of unique to the Eastern Panhandle, not necessarily so much the rest of the state, but the Stubblefield Institute is indeed in the Eastern Panhandle. In fact, Shepherd University is literally on the border of Maryland. The river is right there to separate the two. As more people in this area here become people who have moved to West Virginia and are not born and raised West Virginia, does the definition of what it means to be a West Virginian change? No, I don't think it does. I think what happens is when people, at least folks that I know that weren't necessarily born in West Virginia, become West Virginian, adopt that West Virginia pride quite quickly. And uh, I think I love it sometimes, and, and I'm sure this has happened to every West Virginian, if you're traveling out of state and, you know, you're just kind of talking to somebody at the hotel, checking you in or something, and they ask you where you're from, and you say, I'm from West Virginia. It makes you feel good. And then a lot of times you'll get back. My grandmother was from West Virginia. Unfortunately, we lose people back in, you know, back in the day. We got to we want to make sure uh, that's part of it is to keep people, keep new people and make it attractive. Mikey. Senator, um, recently um, we had a meeting here in the Eastern Panhandle with the um, Department of Agriculture. Uh, Have you have you? been aware of the apple crisis that we're having in the ep actually yes we had a meeting probably three or four months ago with the apple growers out there and the situation of the basically dumping of um apple juice if i can recall exactly what it is uh or or products from china and how it's crushing our own domestic market Right, and we've been trying to work with uh, not just the st- uh, the federal uh, Department of Ag, but also the state to try to help. But they have an excess of of product, and it's 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 really causing, uh, I think, a a, a a a threat to our apple growers. So we are well aware of this. We've been working uh, with them, and we had a meeting, as I said, several months ago, where it was fairly well attended. Probably forty people there explaining the issue to me personally yeah i, th- I think uh the biggest issue for me from what i see is that we're ex we're importing apple juice to our processors that are locally owned which just seems kind of crazy that we're not using our, you know, our apples from from right here in, in the ep right right in the pain so we seem to have, this is a pattern that i think is 
has occurred in a lot of other products when you see our uh, our pharmaceuticals and others uh, that we let uh, uh, critical minerals and everything we let drift to China because why cheaper they can because they don't pay the labor costs and everything else that we do and they they dump them into this country we become a lot reliant on them well the question you've got to ask is what happens uh, when they no longer provide that supply they they then have you over a barrel and it's the same with our food products and, mm-hmm. and I see us as a nation trying to move away from that incentivizing manufacturing and I think ag products should be a part of that particularly apple juice and and because it disadvantages so much of the uh, agriculture community, particularly in West Virginia. Speaking of agriculture, uh, the 2024 Farm Bill is part of the things uh, that are on your agenda, uh, and you can tell us how that's going to proceed going forward here, Senator. Well, we need to reauthorize the Farm Bill. It's obviously a very large package. Uh, impacts our, our farm community, our agriculture community. The largest part of that bill is... Um, the SNAP program, which is, you know, the food uh, food stamp program, has grown and grown and grown, and I think it has taken over, actually, the farm bill. So uh, that's the debate, is what are we going to do with the SNAP program to try to keep it uh, from, uh, you know, growing and growing even more, and how are we, how are we going to make sure that our ag community can provide um uh, all of the ag products that uh, we desperately need in this country. Uh, And so I think what's going to happen, what do we do when we get to an impasse? We just punt it down the road. Unfortunately, I think we probably will not have a finalized farm bill uh, at the end of the year. I certainly would hope we would, uh, but it's a major piece of legislation that's reauthorized every five years. Can can those... Can those two issues be split, the SNAP and the Farm Bill, it, or, or are they just tied together just because you know, that's it, the way it is? It, yeah, you'll, you'll understand this as legislator. You, you, tie, the, you tie one pe- person's interests with another. Mm-hmm. So the farm uh, agricultural portion of that is mostly rural America. The, the SNAP and the uh, uh, nutrition program has been uh, mostly served I don't think it exclusively serves, but it is an urban issue. So that is how this farm bill has been able to get passed successfully, is uniting the urban and rural uh, interests in in, uh, in agriculture uh, together. So I don't see them getting split apart. I, I, it would be good because I think we need to scrutinize both programs, but in this case, I think it stays together. And, you know, I, I salute the, the agriculture community in our state. They do great things. And every day, can you imagine, every day you wake up and you know, I've got so much to do, I can't possibly do it all. And many many of our farmers have other jobs because they can't make money exclusively on their farm. And we're losing our young uh, young people's interest in farming. So that's why things like 4-H and, and uh, the, the uh, classes in school that work with our ag, uh, potential ag students is, are really important. Senator, this is Bill. Um, I, I think you hit that nail right on the head. In our area, and, I, and I've, I've lived here all my life um, and seen lots of changes in the community, and I think uh, the fact is that the, the younger people are not interested in, in farming. and They're more interested in sometimes we have such a, a population explosion in Berkeley County, and, and what once was apple orchards and farmland is now um, subdivisions um, with with homes being built every square inch that you can on there. Um, I think that's the problem. People they're not making money to be able to farm these the land like they used to be able to. Um, so I think that's a huge impact, and maybe that's why we're having to import because we don't have sufficient orchards like um, Berkeley County was once known for. Well, I think that is an issue, but I think also I think the ag community has done a really good job to try to uh, – they have young farmer programs. They have, uh, you know, micro-farm farming kinds of uh, programs. So, you know, obviously when you think about ag, you, you, there's big ag in the middle of uh, Kansas and Nebraska where it's acres and acres and acres. Well, there's a lot of uh, farming that goes on, in, uh, particularly in the eastern part of West Virginia, that serves um, – uh, markets in uh, here uh, in the district. I'm driving out from D.C. 
uh, you know, in the uh, farmers markets, and uh, they can do quite well uh, do, growing specialty products on a smaller farm. So I think also agriculture's transitioning into more precision our agriculture, so they're uh, uh, cultivating not just uh, the product, but also using tech to make uh, better results. And, and so there's, I think we're seeing this a transition, but I think it is difficult when younger, it used to be, you know, the father, son, and daughter would carry on the tradition of, of the farm, and, and that's not occurring like it used to. Let me just state this, that uh, on the acreage I plow, Bill, the tomatoes that I've planted and the peppers that I've planted this year have come in great. <laughs> Beautiful, tasty, Not- delicious, farm fresh food, even, well, even if it's just the tiny little piece of land that I plant tomatoes and well, peppers. Was in. that a raised flower bed in your backyard? Uh, no. <laughs> Actually, just right there in the land. looks beautiful. Senator, do, do you think... I'd, li- I'd like to know how you keep the deer out. I mean, maybe right. we should have a whole segment on this. Well, that's what they make Smith & Wesson for, Senator. <laughs> Lock and load. You're, in Mar- you're from Maryland, though. You can't do like we can in West Virginia. <laughs> Senator, do you think there should be a push to stop foreign companies from buying our processing or our agricultural uh, products? Absolutely. I, I do. I think we, if you look at some of our king like Smithfield Ham and, and yeah. those, the Chinese came in and bought that, what, probably eight to ten years ago? Yeah, it's like sixty percent of uh, our our pigs or or, or or pork products are being sent back to China. Right, yeah. and, and I think you know uh, what are people sleeping here? What what do the Chinese want to do? They want to become the superpower, particularly the economic superpower. What are your one of your vulnerabilities? Certainly, you can see that with the special metals in terms of um, uh, 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 chips and everything mm-hmm. that go into cars and all kinds of phones. And technology it's the same with food if all of a sudden the supply gets it's knocked off for one political reason or another we're in a world of hurt so i, I think we're all waking up to this fact and i do see I, I do see legislation and i think we've seen it at the state too where uh, preventing chinese uh conglomerates from coming in and buying up our acreage of farm and agriculture so i think we are uh pursuing that quite briskly because they're buying farmland next to our our military bases Mm -hmm. well i mean i'm not a genius here but i can see what's going on there so do you think this should be a federal approach and a state approach both legislatures sure i think i I think we should yes i think we should look at this on both the federal and state level yes because i'm not sure we can get it through this through the federal level at this point so the states can uh that are most deeply affected i think they're smart to move forward on this Before we run out of time with you, Senator, I want to ask you about the FY25 appropriations to fund and keep the government open, and then when you get a chance after that, the National Defense Authorization Act. Well, quickly on the National Defense Authorization Act, we have, it is passed through committee. We pass that every year. That sets all of our priorities and the directions for our military, and we see we're in very difficult uh, situations internationally, globally. And otherwise, and so we need to be in a heightened state of readiness. And so this is a very important bill. Uh, it's been ready to go for six months, but unfortunately, the Schumer, who's the leader, hasn't put it up on the floor of the Senate for passage. So we hopefully will do that in the next several weeks. Uh, and then appropriations, the same thing. We passed 12 of our 13 bills before we left for August recess in July. And uh, Schumer, again, has not put these bills up on so that, you know, people were asked, well, why don't you make him or why don't you have him? He controls the agenda. That's why the control of the Senate is so very important. And he, he doesn't bring these bills up because he doesn't want his vulnerable members, and we know this is a tight race going all the way through, to have to make difficult votes. Uh, so it's a political move. What we'll do is we'll pass a continuing resolution in September uh, to pass it probably past the election. So I think it's going to be wild after uh, this November election, to, depending on who wins the presidential, to see what what the House and Senate then will react to. Uh, also, you have served with Senator Harris, who is now uh, presidential candidate Harris. Uh, what have your interactions been like with her in the Senate, and what are your thoughts uh, as her as a presidential candidate? Well, I have served with her. I know her fairly well. And, uh, you know, on a personal level, she's personable and, 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 and a nice person and all those things, uh, fun to be with. But if you look at her 
political agenda and what she's done as vice president. She's extremely liberal. And, uh, I mean, she's a South, uh, San Francisco Democrat, so I, I'm not sure I need to go any further than that than defining her politically. She is um, very, uh, very much uh, a high tax. She came out with her tax plan yesterday. She is, uh, you know, is a spender, a, even more of a spender than, than what we see now. She's, I think, wobbly on the international. We've got inflation because of this, obviously, as the borders are, which I can't believe anybody's letting her get away with saying she wasn't the border czar because we were celebrating that at one point, uh, supposedly. And uh, we have 10 million illegals in this country during their policies. So that's what I would be talking about. High crime in our major cities. That's what I would be talking about, because that, I think, is representative of what kind of president she would be. And uh, I don't want to go through four years of that. I want to ask you about the border and why this seems like such an obvious thing to so many people why border security isn't a bigger issue when democrats are in charge of government i don't know i mean you know the philosophy is that uh, the democrats want more uh, immigration higher immigration because then they will be inculcated to the democrat party and, and vote uh, for Democrat candidates. I, I don't think that's it. I mean, that may be a small part of it. Uh, I think that um, law and order, I mean, and, and strong uh, law enforcement is just not in a DNA of, uh, of the Democrat Party right now. You see this defund police. You see uh, cities that are uh, turning their back on law enforcement of uh, crimes and carjackings and things of this nature. And I kind of think of it as the same way as illegal immigration. Well, it's not that big of an infraction. These are, they're coming from countries where they don't have opportunity. Um, and they just won't enforce the law as it's written now. I mean, we see the president finally came out and cracked down and the numbers have gone down. He could have done this three and a half years ago. And I just think there's a segment of their party who says absolutely not, and they're afraid of that segment of their party. Do you think we will ever seriously address immigration in this country? And I ask it from two angles. One, I made mention of the fact that Democrats, when they're in charge of government, seem to care very little for border security. But Republicans, uh, many of whom own small businesses, are pretty happy hiring illegals to do the work that's required to be done in this country that a lot of people don't want to do. I've had a lot of home renovation work done the last several years in my house. The crew chief speaks a little bit of English. Nobody else does, right? And the people bringing them into the, the people that are bringing them to the house to do the work, I'm guessing they haven't done a whole lot of security checks on these folks to find out if they're here legally or not. They're just kind of like happily accepting the fact that these folks will work. And I'll tell you this, the guys that come to my house and do the work, they work hard. They do. And they get the job done. And then they go on and they do another job. I have no idea if these folks are in the country legally or not. And I'm guessing the person that's sent them to my house doesn't know either. So I don't think either party is really taking this very seriously. Well, we do have an e-verify system where businesses are supposed to verify that their employees are in this country legally. Um, but it's not full scale to every business. And you, you're probably talking about a small business, and you're probably right. There hasn't been a check. I mean, it's, it is against the law to uh, employ illegals in that fashion. So if they get caught, uh, they're going to be in trouble. But, you know, it's, it's a large scale issue. Uh, the bigger question, do I think we will address um, immigration? The frustration is we haven't. We haven't. I've been there a longer time. We have not done that. And uh, I, I think it, it's almost to, it was almost to a crisis point to where we, we need to and have to. Uh, and so we can't leave it to the winds of whoever's in the presidency because you see how that goes. President Trump got numbers way, way down. He built more wall. He put more technology in. He actually... And I think the deterrence was there on the other side. You're going to remain in Mexico while you're cases being heard all of a sudden the numbers go way down but then you you know you flip-flop and, and basically president biden and vice president harris just open the borders right back up and and so that's not a way to um, 
effect have an effective policy. So will we address it? We will. Uh, we should. Uh, and uh, hopefully we, we will sooner than later, but I, I don't have a lot of hope. It's a very divisive issue, and it's very difficult to get a compromise through. Yeah, I think- do, you have, do you have time for one more question, Senator? Sure, sure. Yeah, you brought up E-Verify. I mean, we had that in the state legislature this year, and it still couldn't get through with a supermajority. So that really puzzled me that, that we couldn't get that through. But I think you're right, maybe a E-Verify or some kind of documentation to allow people to work but make them pay taxes. That's the biggest thing, right? Yeah, and I mean, the case can be made that there's a workplace, that there's a workplace shortage, a workforce shortage, which there is. You hear it from everybody. But does that mean then that you're going to legitimize some something or someone that came illegally uh, into the country and, well, we need you now and then just make right. it okay? What about the people that are waiting in line to get here, that are doing it the right way, that are working with their embassies and our embassies? That, to me, there's a fairness equo- equation there, a quotient there, that's not being addressed. And, and so I'm not willing to just raise up my hands and say, oh, well, we need you now, so will make it okay. That's that's not something I'm, I'm willing to do. And I agree with you 100%. As a immigrant myself, it took me 10 years to uh, 10 years of green card uh, to get my citizenship. It took my family a long time to apply, go through all those things. We did it right. right. Um, we came all the way from Africa, and there, there are processes available. You can apply for a work permit in the United States and come and work as a migrant worker or whatever it is. There are ways to come. You look at Ocean City. We have a lot of people from Europe working in Ocean City. There are ways to come and work in America legally. Right. Not by just... Right. Yeah. But you, you said it exactly right. You did it the right way. It, you you we, could have went... Which that's, only not, avenues. Bruce, that's we, not that hard. We need to tighten that screening process if Hornby's getting through that easily. <laughs> <laughs> but it took him 10 years. <laughs> All right, Senator, thank you so much. Have a great time at the Stubblefield Institute this evening, and I know you've got a few stops along the way also in Jefferson County today to take care of a few things. Sounds good. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you, you Senator. Senator uh, Shelley bye. Moore Capito, we appreciate her time on the program this morning. And, you know, she mentioned a couple of things about uh, how Congress has a way of punting things forward, and I think back 45 years ago, I was working at a gas station as my very first job, and you get your first paycheck, and you look down and you see FICA, F I C. Mm-hmm. Who's this FICA guy? Where's what's that money? Why is he taking seven point six five percent of my salary? <laughs> exactly. And and at that time, Social Security was in dire straits. They needed to find a way to save Social Security and Medicare, and they got together. Republicans and Democrats got together, and they worked out a solution to preserve Social Security for the next several decades. And we're in a situation now within the next. 10 or less, 10 or fewer years, that's got to happen again. And that uh, that crisis is looming. And again, we're just punting it down the road. Everyone's afraid to not get reelected instead of getting the job done. But why wait until the right of the election time to make try to make all these drastic changes? Yeah, it, it, it seems it's, it seems that way. We wait until, damage control. Uh, wait till the last six months of uh, of an election year, and then we decide. Oh, we're going to talk about things. But I think, it, like any time you bring up Social Security, the first thing the left will say is Republicans are trying to get rid of Social Security. That's not nobody's ever said that in in that I've talked to. Um, nobody's trying to get rid of these things. They're trying to fix a financial problem, right? It's the same thing at, at the state level. Mm-hmm. Social Security, Medicare, it's a math issue. It's as simple as that. It's a math problem that needs to be solved. There are numbers going in and numbers going out. It's a math issue. It, it's not an election year issue. And that's, right. you know, that's why what Jim Justice is going to call us into special session. I think he's going to ask us right before the election to vote on a massive uh, tax spend reduction. and tax reduction. Uh, Missed revenue numbers again. Just barely. Just there. That's uh, what, three months in a row, right? He's still going to ask us. I guarantee it. October.